Have you ever seen something so bizarre, so beyond belief that it almost felt like it couldn't even be real? Like nobody would ever believe you had they not seen it themselves? If you've watched MMA for long enough, you certainly have, because this sport at times is truly surreal, with elements of its reality mixing together in ways that feel as random as a fever dream. And so today we thought it would be fun to go through some of these moments. The strange, the uncanny, the occurrences that as you witnessed them, you openly thought, I cannot believe this is happening right now. What are the chances? How on earth did everything come together to create this moment? or this phenomenon. It's time to get weird. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 most surreal things to ever happen in MMA history. Hey. Number 10, Nick Diaz strikes a pose. Anderson Silva is one of the most feared fighters of all time. Lightning fast, unbelievable timing, and he was scary confident. He would call fighters in, hands down inviting them, taunting them. Come on, come on in here so I can crack you. Whether that intimidation played into his wins or not, it was certainly there. We've even heard fighters say they had to sort of regather themselves in the cage with him because it was like, oh my God, I'm fighting Anderson Silva, this is crazy. I tried to punch him, but he literally moved his head out of the way and looked at me like I was stupid for doing it. Not Nick Diaz. He couldn't give even the slightest of shits. At UFC 183, the two stars would meet in a bout that seemed impossible. Silva, the longtime middleweight champion, he'd been defeated twice now by Chris Weidman and required a ton of time off to heal his broken leg. He hadn't fought since the break and hadn't won a fight in over two years, which was how long Diaz had been off. After losing his welterweight title challenge against George St. Pierre, Nick did what Diaz's do. They take long sabbaticals. But the unlikely bout came together and in January of 2015, it went down. Within seconds of starting, Diaz was talking up a story storm at Silva, and after a minute, unsatisfied with Anderson's lack of not being scared, homie, Nick laid down and posed in what has to be the strangest in-fight moment that's ever occurred. Captured brilliantly by the media on hand, it's just something you would never expect to see in any fight, let alone one with Anderson Silva. The bizarreness didn't stop there as the whole fight was surreal, but that single moment will stand out forever as an image you couldn't convince someone was real if they hadn't seen it themselves. Number 9. Maymac if you'd have told me in 2016 that Conor McGregor was going to fight Floyd Mayweather in a sanctioned boxing match, I'd have laughed in your face. How absurd that something like that could ever even happen. Conor was in the prime of his MMA career. He was collecting belts and setting all kinds of records. Floyd Mayweather was retired. In what reality do those two throw down? What commission is going to let an 0-0 pro boxer take on one of the greatest fighters of a generation? A man who held 15 major world titles. 49-0. The best boxers of his era couldn't beat him. How in the world was an MMA fighter going to do it? Then in January of 2017, the rumblings began that it might actually happen, that this was a thing that was being considered. The double champ was going to take time away from MMA and box Floyd. It still sounded absolutely ridiculous. There's just no way, right? Well, as summer approached, the rumblings turned into negotiations, and on June 14th, it was official. Oh my God, Conor McGregor is going to box Floyd Mayweather. Hell has officially frozen over. And what's even crazier is that the vast majority of people bought in hard. In 2017, McGregor had the world believing he was going to walk in there and maybe give one of boxing greatest champions a fight. I'll admit it, I was skeptical, but I also thought, hey, who knows? More than enough to get excited about it. Then those absolutely bonkers press conferences happened, the world tour, and you know what? The fight itself was fun. I was into it. Floyd, of course, won in the 10th, but the fight was beyond expectation. 4.3 million buys as well. The second biggest pay-per-view ever. Maymac was a scale of spectacle so beyond reality that it will never be replicated because there will never be another Connor or Floyd to do it. Number 8. Joshua Fabia's Entire Existence Imagine if Anderson Silva had been seriously influenced by Steven Seagal. If you've seen the documentary Like Water, you know that the spider didn't exactly take the sensei seriously. But a far more dubious grifter emerged on the MMA scene in 2019 and took hold of a vulnerable beloved fighter with much darker results. I'm talking about Joshua Fabia, the head of the School of Self-Awareness, who for two years would be the grim worm tongue to Diego Sanchez's King Theoden of Rohan. Fabia would serve as the sole corner and coach for the final four fights of Sanchez's career, despite having no qualifications to do so. Unless you count Chase chasing fighters around with a knife, or punching Diego in the face while he hangs upside down. Maybe it was the death choke he claims to have taught Sanchez. Fabia regularly credited himself for any success the veteran fighter had under his tenure, but as the community collectively began calling him on his bullshit, Josh would take Sanchez deeper and deeper into bizarre and wild conspiracies that were always being perpetrated by the UFC or the people who actually cared about Diego. The self-proclaimed MMA pioneer's 15 minutes would end as a result of several secret recordings he made that would only give the appearance he was scheming a bogus lawsuit and ultimately get Sanchez released by the UFC, a short time after Diego would finally break free of Fabia, ending this bizarre chapter in MMA history. If you want a deep dive on it, go check out Rob's video on the Extras channel, it's fantastic. Number 7. Chris Weidman Gets Anderson Silva'd 
Like so many of you, I will never forget how UFC 168 ended. It was one of the biggest rematches in history. The GOAT Anderson Silva had finally been dethroned at UFC 116 by Chris Weidman. That finish in and of itself surreal. And now we would see the man who looked so invincible throughout his reign, carried out of the cage on a stretcher screaming in agony, having broken his fibula and tibia on a checked kick in the second round. It was the stuff of nightmares. My family, who normally don't partake in MMA, had all gathered for the big fight, and I think some of them are still scarred to this day watching Silva's leg flopping in the wind. Absolutely unbelievable. Almost as unbelievable as what happened seven years, five months, and 27 days later at UFC 261 to the other man involved, Chris Weidman. I was not prepared for what happened to Anderson, but I never imagined in my wildest dreams that exact same thing would happen to Chris. Opening seconds of his fight with Uriah Hall, he throws a kick, it gets checked, he breaks his right fibula and tibia. I nearly had a meltdown. Nobody was with me this time, but I absolutely couldn't even wrap my head around what I was witnessing. What are the chances? that this injury would befall Weidman after it so famously happened to one of his foes. I know Connor broke his leg too recently, so it feels like this shit happens all the time, but it really doesn't. For it to happen to Chris, a nightmare he's probably had before where he's Silva and their roles are reversed, for that to actually occur, it's beyond the human mind's capacity. It's damn near cosmic horror levels of incomprehensible. I almost lost my mind forever trying to process it. Number six, Verdum's weapon of choice. If you know these two fighters, the fact that Fabricio Verdum and Colby Covington had a dust-up in and of itself is not surreal. What makes it so is the boomerang that was involved. Let me say that again. A fucking boomerang. A weapon so unlikely, the circumstances by which it was introduced into this fray seems almost to suggest providence. It's November of 2017, Fabricio is in Sydney, Australia to headline a UFC fight night. Colby Covington is there, just being his Disney decom villain self. He was probably stealing puppies from children or ruining the plot of the recently released Thor Ragnarok. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that the pair bumped into each other outside the fighter hotel, and that's where two accounts of the same event occur. According to Colby, Verdum appeared out of nowhere with a boomerang and threatened to kill him before launching the weapon at his head. Fabricio says Colby called him a dirty Brazilian as he passed by prompting an altercation, the latter part of which was captured in all its surreal boomerang hurling glory by a snooping Dan Hooker. Why did Fabricio have a boomerang? A fan gave it to him right before the confrontation. Talk about fantastic timing. My favorite part is that Verdum has to go pick the boomerang back up after it hits Colby. It doesn't come back to you like the Zelda games. Covington would call the cops and Fabricio was charged with common assault. He was fined $460 US. I'm sure he felt it was worth every penny. Number 5. Joe Rogan World Influencer I'm sure when UFC commentator, comedian, actor, and person who encouraged Fear Factor contestants to Wolftown Pig Uteruses Joe Rogan started his podcast back in 2009 on Ustream, he never imagined that 1,700 plus episodes later, he would have a $100 million deal to stream exclusively on Spotify and somehow end up having one of the most influential platforms in the entire world. If you've been a longtime fan of MMA, there's a good chance you were exposed to the Joe Rogan experience far before the vast majority of the world. To us, Joe was just Joe. He was just another member of the community, and his podcast often reflected that, with guests from the fight world regularly appearing, and of course they still do. Lots of people on the level of fame that Joe Rogan had in those early days have podcasts now that 15 people listen to in total, but being in on the ground floor as Rogan was certainly helped solidify his place in the medium. As a result, this public access TV style program made by a UFC commentator would grow exponentially to the point where it was getting hundreds of millions of downloads a month. If you were on Joe Rogan, you were famous. It was Red Panty Night. Your book or whatever you were Hawking was now well-known. He'd essentially become Oprah. Hell, her show didn't even have that kind of reach. Tesla's stock dropped 9% when Elon Musk lit up a fatty on the JRE. It's beyond insane that something so simple and connected to the fight world ended up becoming one of the most significant platforms in the whole entire world. Number 4. The Elevator Fight Ring announcers announce the fighters before the fight. That's their job. It's not expected that Joe Martinez is suddenly going to open up a can of whoop-ass against one of the combatants in the cage, which is what makes our next tale so surreal. I'm of course talking about the infamous elevator fight between Bruce Buffer and the at the time top 5 UFC welterweight Frank Trigg. While the accounts vary and have changed over time, certain details have lasted 15 plus years, lending very much to the authenticity of the stories despite some fans being skeptical, most likely because the story is so surreal. Here's what happened. It's sometime between May and August of 2005. Buffer, Trigg, and Mike Goldberg are at the Hard Rock Hotel hanging out in Goldie's room. They just filmed something for Spike TV. They decide to go get dinner and drinks and all hop on an elevator down to the lobby. Dana White happens to be on the same lift. White starts talking to Frank about a potential next fight. He'd just lost to Matt Hughes for the second time, when the conversation was interrupted by Bruce, who was admiring Dana's watch. This prompted Trigg to throat chop the legendary ring announcer, which began the melee. It sounds like both sides were only throwing body shots, but a persistent detail is Frank kneeing Buffer in the junk 
In some versions, it stays standing. In others, it goes to the ground and Bruce secures an RNC. But by all accounts, the ring announcer more than held his own. If you find that unbelievable, keep in mind Buff was a kickboxer in his 20s and had considered going pro. And it's an elevator fight. Another detail that bolsters the authenticity is the scar on Bruce's thumb, a cut to the bone that occurred as a result of Trigg's watch, leading to a hospital visit post-melee. I will admit, though, that's some wild shit. Number three, the president at a UFC card. I'm just gonna say this sentence to you, and I want you to think really hard about it. A sitting president of the United States went to a UFC card. I'm sorry, I don't think you really took that in. Let me say it again. A sitting president of the United States, as in there's been less than 50 of them ever, was at the time the active commander in chief of the entire country and was sitting front row at a cage fight. It went down in November of 2019 at Madison Square Garden. Jorge Masvidal was taking on Nate Diaz for a belt they just made up for fun to headline UFC 244. In attendance, Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States. Now, it's not uncommon for presidents to go to sporting events, but I can almost guarantee you that barring a second Trump term in the future, the very likelihood that any active president even mentions MMA, let alone goes to a show, is basically zero. Now, if you're aware of the UFC's history as well as the history of Donald Trump, this really isn't that shocking. Trump has long had dealings in the combat sports world, one example being holding Zufa's first ever UFC card at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. Dana and the former president have been friends ever since. White stuff for him at the RNC before his election. Fight Pass did a documentary about Trump. So in that regard, yes, it's not really that crazy, but the fact that a president of the United States was in attendance when just a while back senators were trying to get the sport banned across the country is certainly surreal. Number two, the UFC 229 brawl. Today, the brawl that took place after UFC 229 is seen as something that was good for business and ultimately not that big a deal. But let's talk about this because while that is very much the consensus, you can't deny that in the moment, it was just about one of the most surreal things that's ever happened in this sport. 2.4 million people tuned in to watch Conor McGregor fight lightweight champion Habib Nurmagomedov, the highest selling pay-per-view in MMA history. And who knows how many millions more actually watched this fight between pirates and international broadcasts. We all knew the tensions were crazy high. This was arguably the worst blood we'd seen in the lead up to any UFC fight. And while it might have just been business for Connor, it was not for Habib. And he made that abundantly clear when, after defeating his rival in the fourth with a neck crank, he immediately hopped the cage and dove into a crowd of people like a goddamn lunatic to fight Dylan Danis. The result being pure chaos. In the fog of the moment, it looked like everybody was fighting everything. Except, of course, John Kavanaugh, who hilariously just kind of sat there. But when on the broadcast, people started hopping into the cage to fight Connor as well, it was a bit like, holy shit, what am I watching right now? Things were getting bad and these were some bad dudes. Sure, it turned out fine, but in some alternate universe, some pretty bad shit went down. Dana White himself admitted the first thing that came to his mind was the riot after the Mike Tyson fight. And if you remember, the crowd was going insane. Habib was getting booed like crazy as he desperately tried to get his belt put on his waist, something Dana refused to do because he thought it might start a riot. Look, I get it. Everything did turn out just fine, but that was as close as the UFC's ever been to getting out of control in a way that could have been really, really bad. And it was in front of the biggest audience ever. I know it's not a big thing anymore, but it's still beyond belief that any of it even happened. Number one, let me bang, bro. What we're about to discuss is truly one of the most bizarre interactions, not only in MMA history, but perhaps all of human history. And I don't say that lightly. The subject of our entry is Tough Season 16 contestant Julian Lane. In the first round of the show's tournament, Lane was defeated. This happened in episode four. By episode six, Julian was tired of being in the house still. He'd lost his fight, he couldn't win the show. He just wanted to go home and see his kids. Mix that strong desire with alcohol and the fact that there's virtually nothing to do in the Tough House to occupy your time besides drink and what you end up with is a very angry, belligerently drunk Julian Lane who had an epiphany in his stupor. If he beats someone up, they'll send him home. Why that someone was Dom Waters isn't entirely clear, although to be fair, Julian began trying to pick a fight with just about everyone, including most of the walls in the house. That was when he wasn't angry crying. As his rage-fueled rampage continued around the house, teammates attempted to calm him down with little success. That was until Mike Hill stepped in and we got the weirdest interaction in human history. Let me bang, man! I don't wanna do that, man. Let me I, I do. Hey, let me bang you kids, man. I'll let you bang. I'll let you bang. You know, sometimes all of us just need a hug and to be told that we're still allowed to bang. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Huge shout out to the legendary once and future King Tomas Welsh for editing this video together. Follow him on Instagram at BigBeatVisual. That's beat as in the band from Doug and not a forceful strike.
Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.